Uh, welcome everybody to uh, the PLP Pathways uh, webinar uh, number eight. Uh, we talked a lot about the topic of this webinar and we also talked a lot about the time of the year. And typically at this time of the year, we're talking about rituals, traditions, and the rites of passage that um, make up uh, you know, middle, the middle level experience. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, that's really changed. And we wanna talk about the, that today you know, in the context of middle level education. So uh, you know, at our last webinar, we were on the precipice of a long-term school closure and the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, since then, schools across Vermont have been closed. We've been in a maintenance of learning phase and now we're moving into a continuation of learning that's going to happen on, that's gonna start on April 13th with the expectation that teachers are gonna be doing their best to uh, keep students learning and moving forward. And the question uh, today that we're hoping to talk about is uh, how do we do that? Uh, how do we reconcile the many different factors involved, including economic hardship, equity, community health and wellness, uh, the displacement and social disruption that many families are experiencing, and all sorts of issues that are uh, coming to play. So that's gonna be the topic for our webinar. Uh, my name is Don Taylor. I'm a language arts and social studies teacher at Main Street Middle School uh, in Montpelier. And I would like our panel uh, members to uh, introduce themselves. And then we have two special guests this afternoon, uh, uh, some students, and I'd like them to introduce themselves as well. And thank you everybody for being here. And why don't we start with, uh, right at the top, we'll start with Maura. Go ahead, Maura. Um, hi, I'm Maura Wheeler. I'm the Proficiency-Based Learning and Technology Integration Coach at Lamoille South U uh, Unified Union School District. Lindsay, do you want to introduce yourself next? Sure. Lindsay Hallman, Executive Director for Up for Learning. How about Meg? Thank you, Lynn. Uh, Meg O'Donnell, I teach on the Red Team at uh, Seven Eight Humanities at Shelburne Community School. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin Peely Hunt. I teach on Swift House, which is a 5-8 team at Williston Central School. I think it's time for Don's students. Uh, Zoe, do you want to introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Zoe. I'm an eighth grade student in Mr. Taylor's class. I'm Emma, and I'm also an eighth grade student in Mr. Taylor's class. And thank you very much for, for being here. We really appreciate it. And um, I guess we'll start uh, with Emmy and Z uh, Sorry, Emmett and Zoe. Um, Emmett, could you tell us, and I'll ask you the, the same question, Zoe, uh, how would you describe the events of the last three weeks and sort of your educational experience through those events? Um, well, definitely through the past few weeks, it's been, um, it's been a massive change of pace. And a lot of, I think, what it was, was uh, getting used to it and seeing uh, what the rest of the year is going to look like. Um, I know definitely at the beginning, uh, especially for me and I believe other students, it was, uh, it felt like a lot, um, you know, a lot coming at them very quickly. Um, and I think that was one of the main challenges of at least the first few weeks and maybe going forwards is um, the integration from, uh, you know, our, our routine we've had for, uh, sometime now into this, uh, what'll be the routine for the rest of the year. Thanks, Emmett. Uh, Zoe, um, how would you describe, you know, what's happened in the last three weeks? Um, I definitely agree with what Emmett said, but there's also just kind of been a, both the change of pace with the academic work and also trying to figure out how to communicate with your family because you're all in the same building all at the same time and I'm not really used to that I know that a lot of other people aren't used to that and it's also just coming to terms with the fact that I mean for me and Emmett we're not going to have an eighth grade graduation the way that we were supposed to and it's kind of just you have to get used to the changes and it can be kind of emotional um, plus the work that is coming from school. Can I ask you just a, a follow-up question? Would you say that the emotional piece to it, um, do you think that that's getting, you know, you're stabilizing in that area or do you think that's kind of up and down um, with 
as you move forward, you, you know, it's kind of up and down trying to figure it out. Well, I think, yeah, um, I think that it's only been like, what, two and a half weeks, I think, since our school closed. So I'm still, I think I'm still coming to terms with the stuff that I've lost and the changes that I have to make in my schedule and routine and sort of just my lifestyle in general. Um, I hope that it will get easier going, moving forward. And I also know that I don't think I was necessarily the most hard hit in this change. I think there's a lot of people who um, they don't have the support that I have um, and just moving into online school at home. There's not the same support system that a lot of people had at school. Um, but yeah, I think it's getting easier and I think it's going to get easier for me at least. Um, Emmett, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about, um, I know you talked about the academic piece, you know, getting used to the pace, but has there been um, an emotional piece for you as well? And how, how does that sort of play out? Um, well, yeah, I think it's, uh, there's, an, there's kind of an emotional piece for all of us, especially because uh, like there was a lot of plans that usually happen for us at the end of our middle school experience, and we're not going to be able to experience them as they were going to happen. So it's, it's, it's hard because, you know, I'm going to be missing out on a lot, but um, I think that, yeah, that there's that emotional experience for all of us, and that it's, uh, you just have to, uh, I'm going to see, you know, have to somehow incorporate that moving forward. So, and, and one thing I do, I want to uh, make sure the panel and our audience understands too, is that Emmett is kind of in a unique situation because he's taken a math class at the high school. So he's kind of a kid who's got a flexible schedule uh, to start out with. But now that, you know, Emmett is, uh, you're taking geometry. Is that right, Emmett? That's correct. Yeah, so he's taking geometry. So, and one of the reasons I believe Emmett, you were doing that is because he wanted to, you know, kind of keep rolling academically and, and get, a, you know, he was ready to, to move forward. So this change is going to have, you know, obviously it has a big impact. Um, does anybody else want to ask a question of Zoe and Emmett about these topics? I, I have a question and, and I think this will come up a little bit later around, you know, cause we're focusing on rituals and traditions and for you, both as eighth graders, you are dealing with a huge loss uh, around many things, but those rituals and traditions um, as you transition from one um, building to the next or middle school to high school. And I wonder if it's probably still too fresh for you all because it has not been a long enough time to really grieve this loss. But I wonder if some of uh, your peers are starting to think about new ways to reimagine those traditions, so eighth grade graduation, eighth grade, whatever, like what that could be like in this, uh, in, on a virtual platform when we're not able to be in, um, in close physical distance to one another. Uh, I can kind of answer that. Um, so I've had, um, uh, uh, there's, there has been some talk of you know, how are we going to, uh, cause let's, uh, one of our uh, traditions that, um, the eighth graders every year, they put on uh, a performance, they put on an eighth grade play. And so that of course has been canceled, but, um, the, uh, so we were kind of, uh, saying, well, what, what can we do instead of this? Uh, and we're starting to talk about, um, options that we have, like, uh, are we going to do something online or is, uh, are we going to wait till it's all over or uh, so yes uh, some options have started to uh, be thought about but nothing has uh, I'd say it's too early on to see, uh, say that anything has really been set in stone in any way. Zoe how about you have you thought about any way that uh, those events may be, there may be some alternative activities. 
Um, yeah, I mean, what Emmett said about the play being rescheduled to a different thing. I've heard talk of it being tra- changed to like a summer party type thing instead of our graduation. And I don't really know what the timeline of this kind of is going to look like. So everything's still pretty up in the air about that. And I think that's one of the hard parts about online school because we just really don't know what it's supposed to look like, what we're supposed to be like what our activity and our um, performance is supposed to look like. It's just kind of up in the air with everything at this point. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other? Yeah, Meg, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to ask. We asked this of our students last week, and I'm just curious. Um, We asked our students to think about and try to capture in some way the sort of the unexpected silver linings. Um, have you noticed, um, has there been any sort of appreciation or something that you were like, oh, wow, I, I didn't notice this before. And now that I'm in this situation, here's this positive or this unexpected silver lining that we're, that we're appreciating. So I wonder if you could share that. Um, I think this kind of goes along the lines of that. Um, but, uh, so I think that this is giving a lot of people, a lot of uh, free time, a lot of uh, time to um, that they don't know what to do with. Um, but uh, for me, I think that uh, that free time, uh, and I think that's uh, for a number of students as well. It's kind of um, giving them an opportunity to uh, try new things. And I know that uh, me and my brother, I've got an older brother, and we started to do some uh, music together, and something that we've never done, but we just started to do it and we enjoy it and uh so now we're starting to do it, uh, uh quite frequently and so i think that um it's it, although there are a lot of you know there's a lot of loss in this situation i think it's there is um some way to look on the bright side and say um okay so there's this is bad in some ways, but um, how can we make it good in others? Um, yeah, I mean, it's left me with a lot of free time on my hands, definitely. Um, and I think that can kind of be looked at as more academic freedom to sort of go forward with individual projects or um, more advanced things that you wouldn't be able to pursue normally in school. Um, And as Emmett said, different activities that I wouldn't have had time or any interest in doing normally. Um, And it's also, I think it's sort of given a lot of people who didn't have very much in common before sort of a common, at least conversation point, something to complain about together, I think. Um, And not really on a massive scale, but I can just see it in whatever my communication is with people in my grade or my school that I don't normally talk to that much. I just see what they're doing and it sort of, it gives me something to think about, like how are the people that I am around all the time, how are they dealing with this situation and how can I sort of adapt along with them? I, I just had a quick question, Zoe, to, to follow up on that. When you talk about communication, how, like, how are you doing that? And what, <clears throat> what has been the best way for you to stay connected to your friends? And I would get, I would ask, I guess, too, is, you know, what role has school played any role in helping you maintain those relationships? And if so, what, what does that look like? Well, For me, me and my close friends, I mean, we FaceTime and we talk several times a day. Um, So I haven't really lost touch with them, but so far school hasn't really been something that I'm connecting with people about. It's more just the common shared experience of what's going on. Um, And I mean, I've sort of been communicating or just sort of keeping tabs on my classmates on and what they're doing through social media. Um, and that's not really through school, so. Thank you. Anybody else have questions that they want to ask? 
Okay, was, this is. Can I ask go one ahead. follow up? I, I really, uh, just what you said, uh, Zoe, about that shared experience, like now there's kind of common ground for everyone um, to connect to connect with one another. So maybe some of the assumptions you had about your peers prior, um, you know, now th that might be changed from what you're seeing on social media and the fact that you all are going through this together. And I wonder if there's like, you know, if you have noticed things about your peers that you would not have seen through like being able to see how they're doing on social media and what they're up to, you know, like some new um, insights into who your peers are that maybe you wouldn't have known had you been, you know, on the regular schedule, school schedule routine. Um, I'm not really sure if I've seen anything new, but it's sort of just a continued sort of look into how they're handling it or how they're, or just the sort of things that they're, that they're, I don't know what they're doing, if that's the right, if that's the right word, but um, it's just sort of, I know that on Instagram, everyone in our grade who has Instagram is on a big group chat. And I mean, we don't use it that much, but just the sort of idea that that's there, it's sort of a new community that wasn't really there before because it's with all these people that I didn't normally talk to when I was passing them in the hallway or something. So, um, I have a question both for Emma and Zoe. Uh, you talk about a shared experience, like this is this massive shared experience, and you say that um, you're connecting with your peers about that outside of school, but school seems to be, it's still, I mean, and maybe it should be still separate, but how would you, like, what would you recommend to teachers and educators to kind of maybe channel that shared experience into, you know, like meaningful, education or what role could school or teachers play in facilitating that shared experience more effectively I guess well I think there's kids who are going to continue to avoid doing their work and that's not going to change there were people who did that when we were in school and there were people who and there's people who will continue to do that um, and I think that's the same with sort of the social aspect of school. If people want to stay in touch, I think for the most part, they'll try to stay in touch with their classmates or their friends. And I know that there's some situations where they're unable to or it, they're, I mean, their, their mental state isn't, isn't allowing them to. Um, but so far what I've seen with, I mean, our classes, YouTube lives, and that's like, a big it's a big conversation with our entire class and the people who contribute are the people who want to contribute and that sort of remained the same throughout Emmett do you have any thoughts on that um I guess that I there might be something to be said about um uh giving students uh I guess the resources if that makes sense to uh, keep in touch, like, um, because there's, you know, through, because of this time, we're not, uh, we're not seeing everybody regularly. And I know that things like um, team meetings and uh, things like that can uh, get students, um, you know, at least seeing each other and talking to each other. All right, thank you. Any, anybody else have questions? I have a question. Um, so I'm wondering if there are things that um, either some of your teachers have done or ideas that you have um, for teachers about how they could help uh, middle school students sort of with this transition, both in processing sort of what's happening, um, but then also like what are some of the things that your teachers have done that you found really helpful over the past few weeks? Um, I think one thing for me is uh, that it's, I find it really easy to feel kind of bogged down to feel like I don't know what to do next. And I think um, it's a, a, a very helpful thing that I, uh, I know Mr. Taylor did and also that I uh, kind of did, took a little farther for myself was to uh, create a schedule so I can 
I can, uh, you know, know what I need to do in the day. So I can, because uh, I feel, feel like that feeling of not knowing what to do next really uh, easily gets to me. I also think there's something to be said about um, because people are not working from home, and usually, you know, home is the place where you go and relax after a day of work, that it's, uh, it's, it that can cause some issues with focusing and feeling directed. Um, and so I think that it's, it's kind of important for students to be able to find a space where they can, uh, where they will, you know, kind of designate as a space to work. And um, as, I think as far separated as those spaces can be both um, not necessarily physically, but uh, is better because um, just having a different space to work and a different space to relax can really, um, I think, at least for me, uh, clear in my head, uh, make me focus just that much better. Um, I think so far what my teachers have done that's helpful um, just sort of laying out the tasks that I have to do moving forward in the week or the day or whatever it is. Um, I think just knowing what is expected of me because sometimes there's just a gap in communication and I have no idea what's going on, what I'm supposed to be doing. And that definitely still happens with some of my teachers, but I know that some others are, um, have sort of, sort of figured out that if you tell the students what they're supposed to be doing, they'll find a way to do it. Um, and yeah, I think the schedule is very helpful. For me, I found that it's less helpful to have a schedule with time blocks and like, this is a period of time where you'll just do academic work and this is a time where you'll practice a sport or something like that. I found for me, it's a lot more helpful and beneficial to just sort of lay out the tasks that I have for the day and then sort of just tick through them chronologically. Um, and that's what, been what helps me the most. And I think that change, that's that differs from person to person, but lists help me a lot. Is, is there a particular, uh, I know, what you just said about how it's different for everybody, I think is, is really important. And, um, and I would just say that like getting feedback from students is so critical right now to know, like Emmett talked about that separation of space. And I know he, Emmett, you had written about that right at the beginning. And I think that's so important, like where your space is and you know, how you go about your work day. That's really, you know, a personal thing. And I think that's important to understand what has been the best communication tool for you, you know, as a teacher who wants to, uh, as a teacher who wants to, you know, communicate effectively with students, what, what's worked best uh, for you? And before you answer that, I do want to welcome, we have another guest, uh, Judy Ross uh, is a master from Kingdom East and she's going to she just joined the webinar too. So, Again, uh, Zoe, and, uh, and and what do you think is the best like tool that's worked for you in terms of the uh, overcoming those communication gaps? Uh, that's kind of a tough one. I think that um, uh, I think that being able to uh, write down what you're feeling, either in an email or uh, like we have those uh, these uh, journals that uh, teach you, that Mr. Taylor can see. Um, I feel like that's a good space where I can say what I'm feeling um, and uh, get it out. Uh, well, what I think I need uh, is best moving forward for me. Um, and I, I I do say I think that uh, it's it's a time that uh, everybody's going to experience it uh, slightly differently. Um, Everybody's going to have their own issues, their own um, things that they want to get done. Uh, and it's, so it's, it's going to be, I think, one of the I, a major, major thing moving forward would be um, uh, personal student uh, experiences. Um, because I, I do think that everybody's going to um, 
uh, experiences differently. So I think that uh, I think that email is the best good, and also just being able to talk face to face with the teacher over Zoom or over Google uh, Meet can be helpful because you can uh, you know it's it's a direct face to face talk. Um, I sort of, my experience has been a little different with that. I think that what Mr. Taylor does is every day he'll send us an email at the beginning of the day and lay out the tasks for the following class and have links for each thing that goes to the Google Classroom document or whatever it is. And I just find that very helpful to, so that when, whenever I'm working on the class period, I can do a task and then I can turn it in in Google Classroom, go back to the email and just sort of go through it. And I guess that's sort of just how my organization process works. Um, and I know that that probably isn't the same for other people. And I've found that the Zoom calls are less, I mean, they're less beneficial for me because to some extent, I found that teachers have a hard time getting straight to the point with what they're trying to say and it just kind of turns into talking for half an hour and then our time is over. Um, so that hasn't worked. I mean, it might, the teacher might be working to make that better, but it wasn't working when I was, when I was participating in those. Um, yeah, I just like having a physical list or a physical copy that shows me what I need to be doing and then if there's extension opportunities then list those as well and then I can just see what I'm supposed to be doing and I can go through it and that works for me. Thank you very much. Does anybody else want to do a follow-up question or related question on that? Okay, uh, okay. so um, I guess one of the things that we need to ask, well, I, I'd like to know is, you know, I think you hit on this before, but what's been like the hard, what are some of the challenges uh, either with the remote learning, um, the move to online? I mean, you just talked a little bit about some of them. It's hard to find the right uh, system for yourself and, you know, getting a schedule, but what have been some of the, I guess, some of the challenges that you face that teachers you know, would, would benefit from hearing what tips would you give us, so to speak, for this time? Well, I think that it's, um, if, if you're struggling with those things, with a routine, with a, with a space, uh, it can, it can be very easy to feel like uh, a little bit of work is a lot of work and that, uh, you're being overwhelmed. I noticed that uh, for myself, and I think uh, uh, initially a lot of people felt that. So I think it's uh, in these times, uh, I think it would be easy for students to feel like, um, uh, you know, they have too much to do, they um, don't know what, when to do it. Um. I've found that try, that staying motivated is very difficult for me or and I think a lot of people because it's sort of been an experience that I've had to go through alone the, the I mean online learning there's there's no teachers in the room with me who are reminding people to do stuff and there's no none of that kind of thing and for me I think the physical act of being able to go to school and sit in a classroom and do my work it was just separate. It was, as Emma said, it's completely separate from your home life. And even if they're, it's not the same place that you're, that you're sleeping at night or any of that stuff, it's still, it's still a little bit more similar to relaxed time than it used to be. And so finding the balance between doing lots and lots and lots of schoolwork and not doing any schoolwork and relaxing, it's kind of been harder to find because school and the built-in schedule that school provides sort of handed that straight to me. Thank you very much. Does any, uh, anybody have other things that they wanna, they wanna ask? 
you guys are, your answers have just been really thoughtful and, uh, you know, just very, very helpful. Um, I guess I, uh, I want to. Meg has her, her hand up. Oh, sorry. I didn't see that. Sorry. Go ahead, Meg. Just have a... No, no, that's, that's okay. I apologize. Um, so something I'm, so I totally appreciated your um, ramble, like how teachers tend to ramble maybe and not get to the point. So I, I'm going to work really hard right now to get to the point. Um, do you, could you describe tasks that you've done that have been engaging so far? That something where um, it turns that motivation around for you, um, or and am at the same for you? Like just something where you felt like, oh, I'm psyched to go check out what today's task is because it's been that engaging or that interesting. Um, I think for me. Uh... Uh, I've got a kind of mindset of work that if I, if I can get into it, if something allows me to get into it, I can just, uh, you know, really focus and really uh, work and get stuff done. But I think that um, at least, uh, I think that's a kind of a slowly ramping up uh, workload it will, is beneficial to uh, students that to you know start off walking and then start running um but, uh, i guess some things that uh really got me uh kind of get me excited for working is um to be able to do something because there's so much uh you know on on the screen and so much on the computer that i think um doing stuff with physical things with your hands and uh it can be you know can be, be uh, fun and be and enjoyable and kind of get uh, at least me uh, focused and uh, wanting to do wanting to do it. Yeah, I think that writing, like physically writing your math or your your journal, is a lot more engaging than typing it. Um, and that might be a personal preference, but I've just found that to be a lot more. It's a lot more real. Um, and I've also found that because there's so much independence sort of with the whole online schooling um, and not really being allowed to leave the house, but you have to be doing certain things at certain times, um, you're sort of allowed to allot the amount of time to a certain task that you think is right for what you're doing. So if I have an hour long block, I can give 20 minutes to one thing and 40 minutes to another, for example. And I found that allows me to focus on the most interesting tasks and the tasks that I think that I can really move forward with and excel at um, while still being able to accomplish the things that my teachers assigned. I have a I have a question about that is how how would you recommend that we make what's interesting to you the things that you're doing because you just said you know you just kind of mentioned well I have to do all the things that the teacher assigned but if I'm interested in something you know it's like those are two separate things and and how do you how would you recommend that teachers start making what's interesting to you be what you're focused on what would that look like? Well, um, I think we kind of talked about this in other questions a bit, but like, I think that it's gonna be, it's gonna be different for everybody, you know? And it's, I think that the personal, personalization will be something that might be hard, but I think that um, students will benefit from uh, it. Uh, I think that everybody's going to have something that they kind of want to do and being able to guide them and see um, how they're going to do it and how uh, how it'll work and how it will be relevant uh, would be something that 
I think would be very beneficial to students. Thank you. I think that um, if teachers sort of give a little more leeway for independent projects or just like sort of individualizing the assigned projects, theoretically that would make things a lot more interesting. But I also think that there's some topics and some subjects or classes that I won't find interesting regardless of what we're doing. And I think that's just sort of how people's brains work. Like you're interested in some things and you're not interested in other things. So there's classes where I sort of just force myself to do it and I get it over with and it's fine. And, and then there's classes where I can sort of take my time and stuff and enjoy the process of whatever I'm doing. And I think a teacher can't really control <clears throat> how much a, a student is interested in the topic in general. I mean, there can be some choice in different subtopics within something but i mean if someone doesn't like math and you're you're the math teacher it's not personal necessarily i mean people just some people just don't want to do math and that's all there is to it <laughs> thank you very much does anybody have any other uh questions um uh, that they want to that they want to pose I guess I'm wondering what advice you have for other middle schoolers and, you know, other eighth graders who are, you know, not together with their friends during these transitions. Do you have any advice for other middle school students? Um, I guess I'd say um, I look on the bright side. Uh, that seems hard, but, um, you know, think about that although you've lost these opportunities what opportunities uh can you make what uh yeah what what things that you couldn't do before can you do now um i think this is a hard question because i struggle with what i should be telling myself on a day-to-day -day basis so i don't really know what advice i would give to someone else but I think it's important to recognize that this whole situation and just sort of being isolated from normal life and it not really continuing as usual, it sort of makes whatever mental health issues someone's dealing with, I mean, any middle school, any middle school student feels sad sometimes and this sort of just makes things all that much harder and that much more lonely because you don't have your friends to talk to about it. Um, and it's also just hard because it's so radically different from what we're used to um, and what we've been doing our whole lives when it comes to school. So it just takes some experimentation, I think. And I also think it takes some some level of forgiveness for yourself because you're not going to be able to function at 100% all the time, nor are you going to be able to work at a super high level um, if you're dealing with other stuff and if you're struggling with sort of the, the emotional aspect of what this has sort of brought on. So yeah, I think that's, that's what I should be telling myself and that's what I should be telling other people too, I think. Zoe, that is uh, fantastic advice for all of us. Thank you so much. Yeah, that um, yeah, that makes me think a lot. And Emmett, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it it kind of just makes me think a lot, and it also makes me think a lot about like what our role should be for here, you know, through the rest of the year, and and the best way that we can serve our kids i mean i think that we talk a lot about some of this stuff but then when you hear it, you know it's the same we've said this since the beginning when you hear it from kids it just is really it's really powerful and uh just makes me think a lot that's for sure um other folks want to weigh in um can I, I'm sorry, Donna. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I did something I, 
I just, it's almost like, um, I wish we could amplify what Emmett and Zoe just shared um, in some way, like kid to kid, like creating scenarios where kids can check in with kids because uh, that idea of like um, making up, making the most of the opportunity and this idea of self-forgiveness and um, I just think are just such rich uh, pieces of advice. So I'm certainly going to steal this and share it with my students, but um, it's got me thinking about what um, PLP Pathways could do to uh, amplify student voice um, at this time. Yeah, and I just wanted to chime in, Meg. Um, our, um, at Up for Learning, we have a Youth Advisory Council, and um, it represents middle schoolers and high schoolers throughout the state. And um, we've been meeting weekly since we've been um, at home. And we used to meet monthly and we decided it was really important to meet weekly, both for the connections amongst our Youth Advisory Council to feel connected um, and in community, but also to think about that very thing. Um, and there is a survey um, that they created uh, and it went out this week for middle schoolers and high schoolers who are interested in making connections, whether it's, and it's cross school connections. So um, maybe you're interested in um, uh, playing music with someone or talking about this topic and, or you're really into this, um, you're an activist in this particular area and you wanna get together with other activists and continue your conversations. Or maybe you, you simply want some help on your math and you can find someone that can do some peer-to-peer -peer support. So we sent out a survey and the, and the response has been fairly uh, tremendous. Actually, we're gonna come together tomorrow as a, with uh, the Youth Advisory Council to look at the results and try to think through now, like, okay, next step is to let everyone know that we've received their survey and thank you, and then starting to put together these connections for folks. So, um, it's definitely like what Emmett and Zoe have shared is both are the profound messages for this time, like about, you know, like what, you know, like what it is every it's day by day. It's, you know, um, we check we need to check in with ourselves and with people around us, but we need to have those connections. And, you know, the themes that I've heard from youth across the state is just feeling overwhelmed, feeling um, distracted, it's really hard to be motivated. Um, and or, you know, I can get it done. And then, you know, and then I'm just kind of like in my, in my space, you know, and so the themes are, are really, um, are similar across the state. And so we, the youth for our organization created this survey, I don't, you know, we're hopeful. I mean, this again, is something we've never tried before, because none of us have ever been in this situation. So for all of us, I think it's what uh, Zoe said to like, take it day by day, check in with yourself, check in with, you know, those, your support system. Um, we'll, we'll see what comes of it, but we're hoping that it can be something that is um, helpful for young people. Uh, you know, and I think, um, I think what Zoe and Emmett have said are just kind of outlining sort of the disruption. And for me, uh, you know, these two kids are in my class and I've seen, you know, every day we were going, we were going good every day. I would see them and it was awesome and they were doing great work and they're great kids, you know, and to have that kind of, um, there's not that sort of finality that you want when you can see, see it through to the end. We have a saying, in our class, it's not where you start, it's where you finish, you know? And right now that finish line kind of got taken away. And uh, I don't know, that's, that's a little bit hard to deal with, but I'm, I'm thinking over time about how we're, gonna, how we're gonna reach that finish line and the way it's gonna look. And you know, something, you just wanna high five a kid so bad or just, you know, be right in the same space with them. And uh, it's just really hard. And maybe to not it's be not able to do finish, that. Sorry. I was going to say, maybe the finish line has disappeared, but that it's been rerouted. 
you know, yeah. it's gonna, um, it's going to look different, our journey to the finish line, but, um, we shouldn't, uh, think that there is no finish line. Like there's still going to be an eighth grade year and there's hopefully still going to be the rituals and traditions and they might just, that, that it might just look different. And so how can we be thinking in that way and using our doing creative thinking and innovative thinking and talking to young people to, to work through this challenge of how are we going to get to the finish line in a way that feels really meaningful and gives us a sense of purpose. Yeah. And, and one of the things, uh, Lindsay and, and Kevin and Meg and Maura that has really uh, been powerful for me is that I've asked the, the kids to submit a lot of the uh, examples of artwork that they're doing and a lot of the creative thinking that they're doing. And it's been overwhelming the, the amount of creativity and art that's come out of this. And I think that, you know, I've thought about like virtual art shows or having some way of representing the creativity and the, and the fantastic minds that are kind of in a way being let loose because they've, we've kind of broken some tradition and, and maybe that we need to figure out how to channel some of this stuff back into our schools whenever we, you know, whenever we get back and whenever we return, I think it's really important. And I think, you know, we we say this all the time, but you need to listen to your kids because when you do, it's just so powerful and it's so meaningful. And I think it's just, I really appreciate Zoe and Emmett coming on this afternoon and taking the time. It's just, it's great. I couldn't be more proud to have you kids in my, uh, in my class. And thank you very much. Um, anybody have anything they want to close with? Uh, Lindsay, one, I guess one thing is if you could, you know, just pass along or just keep us posted on how that work is going. And as soon as you find outlets that you have for kids, if you could pass those along so we could get them connected. I know that uh, Zoe said, well, it's all, you know, it's only been three weeks, you know, but I think that space, the longer we're disconnected, the far, you know, like we need to get on, you know, this, these connections very quickly. Um, but anyway, I think that's that's it for this um, evening. Does anybody have any last comment? Meg, do you want to? Yeah. I, I do. Sorry, so sorry. Um, I I keep thinking about this, um, and just in uh, we don't. I don't want us to necessarily. We're not going to talk about it now because we're still in it too much. But I think something that would be so remiss is if we just started school up next year um status quo and didn't take this um knowledge of this experience and use it in some way to help transform and make school better for better for kids so for Emmett and zoe just as you're thinking about this as you uh reflect on your experience over the next many weeks just uh sharing with us or mr taylor just hey, wouldn't it be cool if schools could do blank? And, you know, uh, we will never know until we try. And we've been forced to try now. And I would just, um, boy, I would, I would just, even if it's like a small grain, grain size thing, just something that, um, that enhances the learning uh, moving forward. So I appreciate and I'm forever grateful for your, your input today. For sure. All right, folks, uh, that wraps it up. I think uh, I want to mention uh, this work is supported by the Middle Grades Collaborative and the Tarrant Institute for Innovative, Innovative Education. I'd like to thank our student guests so much for their input. It's just been so helpful. And I'd also, uh, just as you talk about um, the importance of staying connected, I just really appreciate all the work that um, the folks on the PLP Pathways panel are doing. It just helps me so much to know that people like you are out there and are working on it. And it's just really rewarding and I appreciate it so much. And uh, hopefully we will see you, uh, we'll see everybody soon, okay? Enjoy the rest of your afternoon and thank you everybody. Really appreciate it. Have a nice night. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye now. <laughs>